Welcome to the Your Town Television Program. My name is Jeff Klein, the host for this segment that's sponsored by the Naval Postgraduate School Foundation. And today, for this segment, we are welcoming uh, senior lecturer John Dillard from our Systems Engineering Department, who has a uh, very fascinating career both in the Army uh, and as an academic uh, here at in the Monterey Peninsula area. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. Now, you have just kicked off a major academic program at the support or the request of several of our sponsors, and we're going to talk about that. But before we do, let's go and learn a little bit more about you. So where are you from originally? Sure. I'm from uh, Tennessee originally, grew up there, went to the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Well, that explains why you went to the Army then, because the volunteer sure. and that sure. sort of thing. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. Now, yes. why did you go to the Army? Did you have a history? there? Always wanted to be a soldier, I think, uh, even as a child. My father was in World War II, uh, was a B-17 pilot, was shot down, served as a POW for about 13 months, and uh, despite all of that, I uh, really had the desire to serve in the military. So was he a POW in Germany? He or? was a wow. German POW, yes indeed. So uh, that inspired you to join them. Now, did, how did you go, get into the Army? Went through the ROTC program at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Okay, so you're an ROTC graduate. And then when you graduated, uh, they made you that second lieutenant. What specialty did you go into? Well, initially went into artillery and okay. always wanted to be an infantryman, so a branch transferred in, into infantry, which is a, a little bit more rigorous, a little bit harder, tougher. Physically, that's mm -hmm. true, but no. not mentally. So uh, that usually that transfer doesn't work that way, <laughs> is it? That's sort of a unique jump. Yeah, they're both pretty demanding, really, yeah. uh, mentally and, and physically. So uh, really my heart was, was where the infantry soldier was. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, had some great assignments uh, along the way in my next uh, 26 years. Well, were you stationed overseas? I uh, was stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas to begin with in the 1st Infantry Division. Well, no, that's not overseas. Some Fort people Bank. think that. But no. Went overseas about nine times. Oh, oh I see, from, yeah. from Kansas, yep, yeah. Yep, sure did. In European theater or? Uh, to uh, faraway places like Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, Panama, Germany, of course. Wow. But also Alaska and uh, desert environments too, Egypt. Fantastic. And, and what did you do after that tour? Went to the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So they taught you how to throw out a, yourself out of an airplane? Yes, they did. Wow. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Had two great company commands there in an infantry battalion, and the commander I served with uh, became the uh, division commander eventually, and he's a guy that we talk about often. We still have reunions from oh, time that to time. Right? Yeah, that's one of the nice things about a military service is uh, you serve with a unit long enough, you get to know people. Sometimes it's challenging, sometimes life-threatening, and that's really bonding, and so it's nice to get back with people and see how they're doing. That band of brothers is why we're, why we're there. Now, uh, besides your operational tours, though, you later transitioned into the business side of the Army. So tell us how that happened. I did transition into the research and development field. As you go up through the ranks, you just about have to branch into some other kind of field to go up as a staff officer. Um, and I selected research and development because I was very curious about the equipment we were getting that didn't always work like I wanted. <laughs> and I think uh, even my students today will all have their own stories in any service of equipment that they got that didn't quite work the way they wanted. The system didn't give them exactly what they wanted. So. Oh, you're being polite. Usually so, something like, what Yahoo thought of this? <laughs> that's pretty much what I was saying. So how do I infiltrate the ranks of these scientists and engineers and get my hands around their throat and get them to uh, make something that works? So when you say you went into the research and development side of the Army, what exactly does that mean? I mean, what did you, was that in a program side or an acquisition yeah, side or, yeah. or science side? We call it acquisition, which is a fancy term really for uh, inventing and procuring mm -hmm. materiel, uh, war fighting capability. And um, that requires going off and getting a master's degree somewhere, which is what we do at the Naval Postgraduate School, of sure. course. And where did you get yours? I got mine at the University of Southern California. Okay, in what? Systems management. All right which was the name of my department when I first joined the Naval Postgraduate School. Oh, so it kind of matched. <laughs> oh, it matched great. Uh, the systems theory is what really kind of came along in the 1950s, 60s as systems got more and more complex with nuclear submarines and so forth. We needed techniques like operations research and systems management to resolve the complexity and, and uh, get ourselves to an integration of technologies on one platform. So that's, that's what it was all about. It was more complex than I ever dreamed. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's true. In fact, uh, what are some of the programs that you worked with? I worked on two uh, that are in combat today and still in production today. The Javelin anti-tank missile system mm -hmm. is a shoulder-fired device, and I love getting all the feedback from the soldiers and the Marines who have fired it in theater 
uh, whether in Afghanistan or in Iraq. And then the Army tactical missile system, also used by Army and Marines. It's even been fired off of ships before. And uh, that's been a good long-range um, missile system uh, that's uh, a surface-to-surface, -surface, reaches out two or 300 miles. Now the acronym is ATACMS, is that it? or ATACMS is, that is the name of that system, yeah. yes. And they're just launching a new program to replace it. It's going to be some years before they're going to have that out, but they're trying to double the, the amount of missiles and, of course, double the range. Now, as I understand it, uh, since we're on the ATACM system, uh, the Army's considering modifying that particular system to be able to hit ships as well. They could well be doing that yeah. as they expand the range and the capability to uh, go further. So your program is even growing it in different areas themselves. It's grown so much, it's really morphed into several things. It's a real example of evolutionary acquisition, we call it, the, the idea of modifying and improving things that are already out there. Well, you, you express sort of a, a, a sentiment that a lot of acquisition people who work in that program is, is your program, and it's sort of like your baby. You had to take it through the challenges of, of both the research and development side, making it work, making sure that the funding was there, ensuring that the training was there for the people and the right people, and actually then introduce it into the Army, uh, or the fleet, or the Air Force, depending on which service you have. So you, you actually gain a real ownership of that program, don't you? Yes, yes, you can't separate yourself from your work. <laughs> so your, your ego does become attached to the capability you're trying to deliver, and uh, over-optimism is one of the things that sometimes gets in the way of success. Well, let's transition now to how we captured you at NPS. Oh, I got uh, really lucky. Uh, I was very fortunate to have an assignment out here in 1994 through 96 as a lieutenant colonel in the Army. Uh, so a two-year tour as a military instructor mm -hmm. teaching acquisition management. And uh, that wound me up in the systems management department, what we now call the Graduate School of Business and Public Policy. Um, enjoyed being amongst my, my Army students back then and still maintain lifetime friendships with those folks. And uh, two years there, and then went away for six years, kind of got called back with an offer to come uh, be a senior lecturer out here, and that's where I've spent the next 18 years. Well, that's fantastic. Um, and uh, besides the school, of course, and the environment you're in, there's something to attract you about the area that you may wanted to live here? Oh, yeah. Nobody can't like the Monterey yeah. area. Well, you so, have to uh, temper that with the fog. At least you could travel away uh, and avoid the fog, right? Seems less foggy than it used to be. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's just uh, uh, the cycle of life, but uh, it's really a wonderful place to be, and everybody loves the climate and the, the views and the weather here. Wonderful place to live. So let's go to uh, what your teaching assignments are first. What have you taught over those last 18 years uh, to, our, to the students, and what type of students have you had? Last 18 years, students of all services uh, really involved with the Army as the sponsor of the program in acquisition that uh, that regards the invention phase, uh, what we call the project management phase. Mm -hmm. And all of our weapon system developments really start out as engineering projects. So teaching the engineering project management is what I've done really with an introductory course and with a final course uh, in our graduate degree programs. Mm -hmm. What's happened recently is across the country we've had a concern of not enough STEM education in the United States, and that's right. science, technology, education, or engineering, and math. And as we uh, see ourselves as the, the global leader for technological advances, we don't want to ever be in second place in that arena. No. People see those four areas of science, technology, engineering, and math as being isolated rather than integrated. Uh, as separate academic domains. Which can be very dangerous is what you're going to say. Yeah, I think so. So my sponsor uh, gave me the call to, to recalibrate uh, his education to the current needs of the Army and construct something different than what we were giving him. And so that led to the uh, architecting of this new program. Well, let's talk about that program for a minute. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it is different. The, the Army sponsor for the acquisition programs wanted something uh, additional information or different for their students. What inspired developing that program? First, what's the program called? We'll start with that. Yeah, it's <laughs> called the 522 program. The Navy numbers everything. Yeah, of course so we do. <laughs> the 522 program and the corollary to that is the 722 program for the distance learning civilians. And that's a Master of Science in Systems Engineering Management. Okay. And so 
this is going to be a, a much more holistic and interdisciplinary program than what we have been providing for the last 15 or 18 years. Uh, it's going to be much like what my sponsor had back in 1996 when he was out here as an alumnus. Ah. So uh, when he uh, occupied his current job, uh, he turned to me and said, I want more technical, less managerial, and I want you to help me recalibrate where we're going. The Government Accountability Office had really chastised the Army in particular for billions of dollars wasted on several failed programs that just hadn't done good systems engineering up front. So he said, I want some more of that. I still want 18 months, no longer. I want you to integrate the Joint Professional Military Education, which is our four Naval War College courses. What do you mean, no longer 18 months? That's You're talking about an extension of, of time here. Back then, he spent 24 months here. Right, he right. Wanted so he wanted a full two-year program. To, he wanted it to stay at 18 months. Okay. Oh, he wanted to stay at 18 yes, months. Yes, he wanted to stay at 18 oh, months, okay. get those officers back to work as quickly as he can. But he wanted level three. We have three levels of education uh, for uh, training and education in different acquisition fields. He wanted level three in contracting and program management and in systems engineering, as well as the JPME. So my and colleagues... He didn't want him to take music or ballet, too? No, I mean, none of that. Back. I'm no. sorry. The reason I'm being cynical here is that is a lot of material. Didn't want anything <laughs> extra in there. There wasn't any room for anything uh, Exactly. Extra. Not in 18 months. In fact, at first we thought we just couldn't, couldn't provide it. And right. We tried for about five years with his predecessors, but we couldn't optimally get there. So with the help of my colleagues across the campus and the Systems Engineering Department, uh, we constructed this program and uh, got it approved through the Academic Council, got a curricular review, got everything signed off. And uh, three weeks ago, we had 30 officers show up for this new program. Oh, so this was the, this is a, the new program just started this quarter? It is underway, yeah. and those 30 guys and gals are just excited to be here and excited to get underway with their new studies. So it, it's a highly interdisciplinary program between our business school and the systems engineering uh, department. Is yes. that correct? And even the school that you're in, the, uh, the operational uh, the information op science information as well. Sciences, yep. So uh, are they going? Are the students going to do a traditional uh, thesis individually, or will they be project oriented, or, or what? How are you going to? What's their final? Um, a test to see if they've captured what you need them to know. Well, the final test really uh, takes us back to why we morphed into this program. It's much more product oriented than process oriented. I think our old program was much more focused on policy mm -hmm. and procedures and process and regulations. And this one's much more focused on product and capability and, and moving the needle. So their capstone project won't just be a single thesis by a single author. It'll be a four or five person team oriented on architecting a solution that's a very applied student research type of solution to a real world problem. So they'll have four or five students working on it, and obviously a faculty member as well. Uh, will they get their uh, topics externally? Will the Army provide that to them? Or? We will be getting topics from the sponsor. The oh. Army's already stepping up and doing some of that. <laughs> Great. And the students are eager to sign up way earlier than they ever did for are, the topic of their choice. Are you at liber liberty to say some what some of those topics are? Uh, not, not quite yet, but they're going to be real-world problem solvers for sure. Right. Well, um, well, and they'll also be able to, of course, pull across expertise of NPS yes, or yes. wherever else they need to go in yes, the Army. Yes, yes. Faculty coached and time phased, I think, is going to be also key to this new program. We used to just kind of let the students go off on their own around their third or fourth quarter out of six quarters, and we'd magically wait for something to appear just in time for graduation. This way, we're going to be more involved with them along the way. Well, that's going to be fascinating and directly applied in one of the great ways we can use NPS to influence what's happening today. But your uh, career pattern uh, drives me to ask this question about the students themselves. You were uh, artillery, then infantry, and then infantry, and then got into the R&D side. Are your students have similar backgrounds, so they come from different branches, all then to go into uh, the R&D and acquisition side? They do. They do indeed. We find that technology is somewhat generic in how it moves. Uh, it takes money, it takes time, and then you have to make investment decisions along the way. Um, but you have to architect a solution in early on. Mm -hmm. I think we see it with Uber and Tesla and Amazon and Apple all trying to get the driverless car. Um, the one who does the best job up front of architecting uh, a modular, uh, open type approach is going to be the one that uh, crosses the finish line first 
and maybe is most successful even after they're the first to market. But uh, the bottom line is not all these officers that are going through this program are engineers to begin with. No. They come up with different degree programs and you give them the sense of that requirement to design that architecture early. In fact, we have an army of psychology, criminal justice, history, and <laughs> art majors. Oh, that's great. Very few engineers. And so we can't make them engineers, but right. we can make them engineering managers and right. able to ask the smarter questions of the very diverse team of industry and government experts that they'll have uh, doing the work that they need done. Now, you mentioned a distance learning program, too. So this program was obviously accepted enthusiastically enough by the Army to also extend it to Army civilians in these fields as well. Is that kicked off already? Yes, it's kicking off into the fall. Okay. So we already have 30 students lined up for that. And yeah. that's all over the country, right? They all have over different the commands yes. and they take lessons. Uh, how, do, how do they get their lessons? And they that take their lessons, lessons through a web-based uh, tool that we use called Collaborate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it uh, allows them to stay at their desk and not have to move to a big conference room to do a video teleconference. And uh, they can even be at home and access. They can be in a hotel on official travel and access their classes. And what it's done for us at NPS is it's brought their experience into the classroom. So in the civilian population, much more experienced than our military officers who are just coming out of the operational fields like you mentioned, and able to bring in their anecdotes, their stories, their experiences, their perspectives into the classroom. It's enriched the faculty greatly at NPS, and hopefully it's enriched the students. Well, John, one of the great things about having you on the guest today, as a guest today is the fact that uh, most of our local community sees Naval Postgraduate School or colloquially that Navy school. But in fact, we serve all branches of service and the Army is a major component of that. We have students in all curriculum who are soldiers and this is one of the major ones and thank you for producing it and continuing to strengthen our Army and our service. Oh, it's an honor to do so. And thank you for joining us on this section of the Your Town Television Program. My name is Jeff Klein, your host uh, for this NPS uh, Foundation sponsored uh, program and segment. Please join us for future segments where we'll be talking about interesting things that our faculty and students are doing on the peninsula, around the country, and around the world.